Hi everyone, this is the third video in the series Introduction to Literary Theory. The topic of this video is Marxist Criticism. This supplements chapter five in our textbook, Theory into Practice. So as in the other videos, we'll start by identifying some of the major figures in the development of this theory, starting, of course, we have to start here, uh, Karl Marx, who uh, befriended um, another man named Friedrich Engels in the 1840s. They collaborated together. Um, they, they, wrote, uh, they wrote some notes down that later became a book called The German Ideology. Uh, I think that appeared in the mid-1840s. And of course, uh, perhaps most famously, the Communist Manifesto of 1848, in which they diagnosed the ills of um, modern industrial capitalism and social classes and call for a revolution to overturn that system. Uh, that appeared in 1848. And then the, the, the major monumental work that provided the philosophical underpinnings for, um, for this entire philosophy was the three-volume Das Kapital um, that appeared in 1867. This is Georg Lukács. And Lukács' contribution to Marxist theory is that he was among the first to apply um, Marxist uh, political theory to literature. Uh, he did this in a book called Theory of the Novel, titled Theory of the Novel. This appeared in 1916, uh, not translated into English until the 1970s. Um, and then another book that was more strictly Marxist philosophy, history, and class consciousness. Um, which appeared in 1923 and was translated into English in 1972. One of the things you'll notice about a lot of these uh, European um, Marxist philosophers is that their books were written a long time ago and then got translated in this very narrow window in the late 60s and early 70s when uh, academic interest in Marxism really took off. Part of the Cultural Revolution in America in the 1960s. Okay, so after Lukács, we have Antonio Gramsci, uh, who wrote The Prison Notebooks. Uh, these were published posthumously in 1947 and then appeared in English in 1971. I believe they only appeared in selections, although I think they've all been translated and published now. I'm not quite sure about that. Um, but we'll talk some more about Gramsci's theories a little later in this video. This is Louis Althusser. He was a, a French philosopher, pretty controversial because he he murdered his wife in 1980, strangled her to death, um, and pled insanity and and uh, won that case, and then continued to live another 10 years um, as a a a public intellectual in Paris. So pretty controversial figure. He did a lot of work on Marxism. Uh, the work he's best known for uh, in, uh, in America is his book, Lenin and Philosophy, which was originally published in 69 and then translated in 1971. And then we have some English-speaking Marxist, Frederick Jameson, uh, still alive. Uh, he introduced a lot of uh, the, the European Marxist intellectuals to the, to, to the English-speaking world in the early 1970s, and then published um, a work of uh, literary criticism, The Political Unconscious Narrative as a Socially Symbolic Act. That appeared in 1981. Those are his two major contributions to... Marxist theory amongst English-speaking critics, and another one um, who, who sort of pairs with him is Terry Eagleton, who also is still alive, at least as of the recording of this video, and 
his two books, his two, he's written extensively um, on literature and literary criticism, but his two, his two early major contributions to this topic, to the topic of Marxist literary criticism, appeared in 1976, Criticism and Ideology and Marxism and Literary Criticism. So psychological criticism attempts to explain literary texts by focusing inward, by looking at the deep subconscious of authors and characters. Marxist criticism does the exact opposite of that. It looks out outside at the real world. It emphasizes the external material conditions that influence the production and consumption of literary texts and how the stories those texts tell reflect those conditions. So looking outward instead of inward. And let's take a look at some of the key concepts here. We'll be oversimplifying a little bit. I mean, these are concepts that get elaborated in, in volumes of, of work. Um, and, and there is not necessarily a consensus or agreement on the concepts or the mechanisms that I'm going to be describing in this short video, but this is a good introduction. Um, so Marx and Engels believed that what separated human beings from animals was our capacity to produce our means of subsistence, our ability to, to, to manufacture, to control food, shelter, and clothing. But along with this capacity came unequal relationships or social classes. Uh, some people had more power or control over resources than others. And this, this structure, this class structure, was supported by various ideological apparatuses, like, like the military, the army, or, or family structures, or religion, uh, or legal systems, that all these things serve to stabilize um, uh, the, the, the class structure and the, the balance of power in societies to, to maintain control over resources. So we'll start by talking about the base. This is the means of production, the land that's needed, the labor that's needed, um, um, the, the capital that's needed to produce the means of subsistence. Uh, this is called the base. And then there is what Marx called the superstructure. Uh, this would be um, the political or civil institutions that promoted values and laws and culture. The, the collectively, we'll call this the ideology, you know, the, the belief system that sustained um, the relationship between the different classes and the, the means of production. Now, this relationship uh, is complicated uh, we can talk about the base being the, 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 the economic conditions of society that define what, what we're going to call its material circumstances, the economic conditions, the material circumstances. That is the base. And then the beliefs, the values, the institutions, and rituals of society define its historical situation, and that is the superstructure. So we've got these four interrelated terms here, superstructure and historical situation, and then material circumstances and base. And Marxist philosophers debate this a lot. You know, to what extent does the, do, the, do the means of production create the political and civil institutions that, that manage them? And to what extent do those do those uh, values, beliefs, and institutions then shape the means of production? Uh, it's, it's, it seems to be a reciprocal relationship, but obviously a complicated one that um, gets worked out um, in different ways depending on the, the theorist. Less controversial is the identification of the lower class the proletariat in Marxist philosophy. These would be the producers. These are the ones who, who make things. Uh, they are the makers. They, they, they work the land. They, they, they work in the factories. They manufacture things. 
They're called the proletariat or the producers. They're generally identified with the lower class and associated with the base. And then there is what Marx called the bourgeoisie. Um, these would be the owners of the means of production, and they have power. And they, they have authority over the superstructure. They control the ideology, the politics, the legal system, the financial systems, uh, and the culture. And obviously, because we're talking about literary criticism, we'll talk more about the role that literature plays in all this in a moment. But the bourgeoisie has power over the proletariat. So Marx and Engels postulated that the natural progression of our means of production and ideological apparatuses would eventually lead to the complete dissolution of the class system. And this is a process that Marx described as dialectical materialism, sort of wrapped up in Hegelian philosophy. Um, and and in, in Das Kapital, he, he, he works this out in sort of a grand historical narrative that begins with ancient agricultural civilizations that relied on a feudalist system of landholding and food production. And that over the course of centuries, this evolved into modern industrial society based on capitalism, the manufacture and exchange of objects. Uh, one day, the thinking goes, the disenfranchised proletariat will recognize their, um, their subjugation and they will rise up and seize the means of production from the bourgeoisie, resulting in a new ideology of communism and conditions of universal economic equality, you know, the abolition of private property, um, the, the equal distribution of wealth, and so forth, the ideals of communist political thought and economic thought. So let's talk now about the role of culture and specifically of literature in, um, in Marxist philosophy. So Lukács was among the first to recognize that like other cultural forms like painting or, 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 or music, um, that literary works reproduce or reflect, to use uh, a key word, um, they reproduce and reinforce society's means of production, and therefore they are part of its ideological superstructure. And the term for this is reflectionism, that culture reflects the means of production and, and the ideology of the society in which those cultural products are produced. So later Marxist critics elaborated on reflectionism by observing the extent to which the dominant social class maintains control over cultural production. This was described by Gramsci as cultural hegemony. That's, that's his fancy word for this. Um, the ruling class, of course, is unlikely to tolerate cultural messages that challenge its hold on power. And since it controls the means of cultural production through finance, through government, through media, through, through the legal system, literary entertainment tends to reinforce the status quo since anything that would challenge the status quo would be easy to suppress or, um, or uh, well, censor. Louis Althusser identifies culture, including literary production, as one of the mechanisms of what he calls interpolation. Uh, and this is his word for the way the dominant upper class persuades the lower classes to accept as normal or, or even as ideal the means of production and the historical situation that maintains their subjugation so that the lower classes never never achieve an independent class consciousness that allows them to challenge um, the, the, those who hold power. So Marxists refer to this passive affirmation as false consciousness. However, uh, Althusser and, and other Marxist intellectuals acknowledge that the lower classes have access to alternative forms of cultural production that may challenge the status quo. And that is uh, obviously an area of um, fertile 
um, fertile theory in the field of literary studies. So Marxist literary critics examine how literary texts reflect the means of production and historical situation of the writer and his or her readers. So I just want to end this video by talking a little bit about some of the things that a Marxist literary critic looks for, introduce a few more terms to you here. Um, first, they look for evidence of the means of production and and the circulation of commodities. You know, what do objects mean in the literary work? Is their meaning defined by their use value? Um, or is it defined by their symbolic sign value? So, so do objects uh, signify or, or symbolize class status, for example, or privilege? Um, so looking at, at, at uh, commodities like, like clothing or um, um, luxury goods, for example, or, or even books themselves as commodities can, can um, result in some interesting insights into literary works. Looking for evidence of class consciousness and false consciousness. So we've talked about false consciousness already, um, sort of how, how the lower classes uh, accept the conditions they live in as normal uh, and um, um, unchangeable. But class consciousness is the idea of of how different social classes think about themselves, what they believe about themselves, how they frame their interests and priorities. That is called class consciousness. And literary critics look very closely at how the different social classes portrayed in a novel. For example, um, like a novel like Charles Dickens is really good for this because he shows, um, you know, the full so it gives us a full landscape of social relations in London in uh, the mid 19th century. Uh, so class consciousness and false consciousness. And then finally, uh, the Marxist literary critic will examine how conflict and tension um, reinforce or challenge the prevailing ideology. Uh, so, so does a literary work basically maintain the status quo or does it, does it uh, question it, undermine it, challenge it? And usually um, critics are, are really interested in how conflicts and tensions are resolved. You know, at the end of the story, who wins and who loses? Are, is the class system basically preserved intact or are there significant challenges to it? So here's a whole set of concepts for you uh, to think about um, related to Marxist criticism. And that concludes this video.